Hello, it's great to be with you. My name is Martin Dyer and I'm very glad to be part of the Irish Cultural Centre in Hammersmith's celebration of National Poetry Day or Poetry Day Ireland as we call it. The theme for which this year is New Directions, Maps and Journeys. I'm going to read three poems for you, three poems about three musicians and I hope you'll see that in some way these poems connect to that overarching theme, the idea of new directions, and maybe particularly the idea of, of journeys. I have a poem about the composer Connor Walsh and a poem about the Leitrim-born singer John Riley, and also a poem in tribute to the English folk singer Nick Jones. I'll start with the John Riley poem. This poem is called John Riley's Audition, Ross Common, 1966. John Riley is famous um, in his own right as someone who was a, a bearer of tradition. And a number of the songs that he learned from his parents and carried through his life and uh, sang while on the road he got an opportunity late in life to set down and record through his friendship with the folklorist and song collector Tom Munley. A number of those songs, The Well Below the Valley and Raggle Taggle Gypsy in particular, fed into the early days of the immortal group Planksty and were a particular inspiration to Christy Moore. But John Riley, in his own right, and um, particularly as evidenced on the the album The Bonnie Green Tree, which was released on the Topic label in 1978 with wonderful sleeve notes by, by Tom Munley, about 10 years after John Riley's death, evinces his extraordinary singing talent. So he wasn't just someone who was transmitting music. He was also a, a gifted performer, a gifted interpreter of songs. I thought maybe in relation to the overarching theme of new directions that maybe the story of John Riley connecting with, with Tom Munley represents a moment where a long and discreet and mysterious channel of oral tradition takes an abrupt left-hand turn into the mainstream and into posterity. Well, here's the poem. John Riley's Audition, Ross Common, 1966. On entering that near eclipsed pub in Boyle, the collector received a proud nod from Dodds, the owner of the place, who the night before had promised, I know a traveller, a man so full of old songs it would frighten me. Dodd's eye cast a curatorial light now towards an isolated drinker by the fire, a dignified clown, ruined boots and teeth, generous eyes, unreckonable age. When I say full, Dodd's had said, I mean full to the brim. He had overblown it more than likely, but this time, no. The required ghosts were in John's speaking voice, round a tree of verses that swivelled when he sang and caught all hearts. This next poem is called Glossopdale Folk Club Forever. And in this piece, I'm exploring, I suppose, an aspect of the tragic silencing of the folk singer, Nick Jones. He had a car crash in 1982 when returning from a gig in Derbyshire Glossop in Derbyshire to his home in Cambridgeshire and as a result of that was left with 
devastating injuries and was unable to perform, unable to, to write or record. But he did return to the stage after a long period of heroic convalescence um, in 2010 and played a number of gigs and then, and then retired. But before his car crash, he had released five albums, the last of which, Penguin Eggs, is considered by many people to be, to be a masterpiece. I certainly find it an inspiring record. Songs like The Humpback Whale and Courting is a Pleasure are truly marvellous. And there's something wonderful about his playing, something wonderful about his, his voice. But there's also tremendous wordcraft in, in amongst the songcraft. So this poem, in tribute to Nick Jones, as I say, is called Glossopdale Folk Club Forever. On the road home, sometime after 2 a.m., the pit of 1982 got darker. In the echoing lane behind the club, his beaming audience, made up, it seemed, of little more than three local families, had waved him off. Another transcendent gig. He then drove twice across Glossop Brook Bridge, circling accidentally back to the venue, where future nights were sealed again in laughter. Then off he went alone down Winter's Road. He should not have survived the crash. This is a key to the legend. Death had won outright. But death's bold owl rose inconclusively from the flame-littered meadow. Similarly, his long years of healing have had no logic. Beyond deep-rooted guitar addiction, the cooperating hearts of grateful songs, life's thirst for life, and the Glossopdale effect. This last poem is called Pharmacy in memory of Connor Walsh. I grew up with Connor Walsh in, in Swinford in, in County Mayo, and we bonded through a shared interest in the possibilities of the crossover between piano and poetry. And through our 20s, for a number of years, we wrote and performed as a, as a duo, and we called ourselves The Shore. And that, that name is a key to the, the double life, the, maybe the harmonious double life that Connor Walsh lived. And it's also a, a key to the, the power of his music. He was a, a passionate angler and an authority on river conservation and an authority on wildlife. So to partner with him as a poet was to be, in one sense, exposed to an extraordinary musical talent and to the, the power of someone who could spellbind an audience. And the power of someone who very early in life was figuring out what it might mean to be a professional or to have a professional approach to an artistic dream. But at the same time, Connor was also an extraordinary vessel of impressions of the natural world. So perhaps for that reason, in this, which is the first poem that I have completed in his memory, I separate him from, from the piano, from, from his compositions, and, and separate him in a sense from the story of his legacy. His audience continues to expand and the accolades keep coming. But here is 
here is the Connor Walsh that I find myself returning to in my in my memories as a kind of a poetry resource as as a figure on the landscape and a figure in the landscape. He died at the age of 37 of, of a heart attack. And in this poem, I, I picture him gathering foxgloves, that, that source of digitalis, which has functioned for centuries and still, still does as a, an ingredient in heart medicine. Pharmacy, in memory of Connor Walsh. Foxglove. I'm led to believe you can see my heart's want of balance. Even though, as a flower, your life is a God-given blindness. They say, too, that because of your poise, your personality... You are alive to her need of a petaled voice. One that will explain to her intimately her own percussive heat, her doubt. Famously, thus, you've led bad hearts to the trough of wholeness. If, Foxglove, you are true, then do not wait till I have locked you in compounds to express your deep vocation. Radiate now, this very moment. Speak out and boost my hands as I cut you here in this steep, wild, vaporing, blue-roofed County Mayo drain. And listen carefully too and more than carefully, as I listen to the bright declining bird, my wet shirt shields. Thank you.